Good grief. Oh, good grief. What is good grief? Well, I'll tell you what. I've been grieving all week because Jeff left town and said, Hey, preach on grief. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I have grieved all week putting this together because this is hard stuff. And some of you guys in this room have been through some terrible stuff, terrible tragedies. And I don't have anything to say to make it better. My prayer is I don't make it worse. And that God has something to say that could maybe make things a little better. As, as I prepare this, there's a little booklet called Good Grief. And I read through that. I thought, that's not it. Threw that out. Although I... I would recommend it. It's worth looking into, but I read it. And thought, no, that didn't tell me anything. Because to, to start where I'm, I'm coming from, um, I deal with a constant state of grief. Um, just from in the, in the last decade or so in my family, we've had so many losses. I, I was blessed enough to get to, um, gosh, mid-30s, still had all grandparents, Everybody in, in, in the last decade lost all four grandparents, my wife's mother, my mother, uh, uncle, just, um, and I, I, I can tell you guys, because this one will be easier for me because my dad's not here in this service, but I go through a constant state of grief watching my dad on his own for the last three and a half years, and it's awful. So... Jeff told me as I was giving him a hard time last week, last week was very hard for me because we sang at the end of the service, uh, Jesus Messiah. I avoid that song like the plague because it was my mom's favorite song, and I cannot sing it. And so I told the uh, crew as we were practicing, especially the, the ladies who were singing last week, I said, this is in your key because I ain't singing. I'm going to try, but it ain't coming. And I'll get up here and I'll sing a line and I'm going to start getting ugly and back off and keep strumming. So you all are singing this. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think, maybe the last um, last time. And I, I tell you what, Al, I hate this mic. I hate this drive through thing. And it, I'm going to go back to my good old handheld. All right, how about that? I like this much better. Plus, I'm a musician. I got to hold something. I can't stand to have that. So we'll we'll figure that out as we get there. But here's here's the deal. We struggle with grief, especially in the church. We have a world that knows how to grieve out there, but we think, well, gosh, if I love God and I trust God, I'm smiling all the time, and that's not true. So, you know, the truth is you're either in a storm right now, you've been through the storm, or your storm's coming. Forecast is the storm's coming. If, you're not, if things are going great now, watch out. Um, in the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, God made everything and said it is good, and everything was good. Adam and Eve had fellowship with God, walked in the garden, everything was perfect. One day we'll be in a heaven where God will wipe away every tear, everything will be perfect. Beginning was perfect. Our destination is perfect. We're in the in-between. We're no longer in Eden. And if you're here today, you're not in heaven. And we're in the in-between. So I don't, I don't have any screen notes up here. But if you want to write any notes, uh, here's a good one for you. Sometimes life sucks. <laughs> so if you want, write that down. So I can promise you, sometimes life sucks. I have a really good friend who kind of has this motto, and she's a God-fearing Christ follower, and uh, she says, 80% of life sucks. It just does. Just the, the monotonous routine, death, loss, suffering, tragedy. But 20% is beautiful and makes the rest worth it. So hang in through the 80% 
and get to the 20. Well, that's not very... Jesus came to give us abundant life and joy. And uh, yeah, that's right. That's right, too. Both. Sometimes life sucks. Life is hard. Nothing works perfectly. You know, look, look at, look at uh, our bodies. Those of us who are getting older, they don't work perfectly. Things do not work right. The weather doesn't work right. The economy doesn't work right. Our relationships don't work right. Things are messed up. And we grieve little things and big things, but things are messed up. I think at its core, grief is just knowing that this is wrong. What has happened to me is wrong. It is not right. The, one of the best things that I found this week in preparing was, uh, I think it was Rick Warren that said, grief, you don't get over it. You get through it. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. You can't avoid it. you got to go through it. And... We were designed to go through it, believe it or not. We are. We're meant to go through it. We're not going through it alone, but we got to go through it. It's painful. It's, it's awkward. You know, I mentioned my mom. My mom passed away um, about a little over a year short of mom and dad's 50th anniversary. And um, so what, what do you do? Here comes the 50th anniversary. You can't not do anything. I mean, it's this milestone. They would be married if she hadn't gotten cancer. So what do you do? Well, we, we go out and we take Dad out to this uh, nice dinner. And um, the server uh, says, um, are you all celebrating anything today? And uh, I just said, no. And uh, after she left, Dad said, why did you say no? And I said, well, do you want to explain it to her or me? <laughs> and he said, yeah, OK. I said, we, we don't need to explain everything to the server. I said, we're just out for dinner. We know what we're celebrating, but we, we'll still go out um, October 12th, would have been mom's uh, birthday. We, we still go, we'll go out to dinner. And so I think dad's used to it now. Y'all celebrating any tonight? No, we're, we're not gonna explain that. We're, yeah, we're celebrating my dead mother's birthday. Oh, great, that's fantastic. But you know, Ecclesiastes is a great book of the Bible and I love it because um, it gives us permission to say life sucks, gives us permission to grieve. When, when I was going through a hard time in my life uh, eight or nine years ago, I loved reading Ecclesiastes because Ecclesiastes says it's just meaningless. Everything we've accomplished, we're chasing the wind. It's just life is meaningless. There's nothing new under the sun. We just keep doing the same, same thing. People who have gone on before us after a few generations, nobody knows them. You don't remember them. You're going to walk this earth and be gone, and nobody know who you were. Life is meaningless. And so I got a lot out of reading that, but you can't stay there. You can't just park in Ecclesiastes. But I know most of you know these, these words. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up what has been planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. It's this tension of these opposites. We mourn at a time, but later we're going to dance. We weep at a time, later we're going to laugh. And so, as I read that book, Good Grief, as I watched and studied some sermons online, I didn't just want to get up here and give you a report of, well, here's what so-and-so said, and here's what so-and-so said. The, the, we can all be thankful. best thing is that God said something to me, and he did, took me to a passage that I wouldn't normally think of uh, for this, uh, but I felt like God showed me some new things, and I, my hope is that it gives us all some comfort because we're all either in the storm, coming out of it, or going into it. I'm going to John 11, and we know this as the death of Lazarus. And normally we don't look at that at the death point because we know what happens. I'm going to spoil it for you because I'm not even going all the way to the end of the story. Uh, Jesus raises him from the dead. It's one of these incredible miracles, but I'm not going to go there. I feel like God was showing me something different in this story. So, and I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit, so I would encourage you all to, to read it later on on your own, even if you're familiar with it. Read it, because the Word of God is living and active, and He'll probably show you something new you haven't seen before. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters went, sent word to Jesus, 
Lord, the one you love is sick. Isn't that great? They had such faith. What do we do? Let's call out to Jesus. We would say, man, that's, that's what we do. We call out to Jesus. God, something is wrong. Do you see this? Help. Jesus, help. They sent word to Jesus. But um, what happens in this story is, you know what Jesus does? He stays where he's at. He says, okay, gotcha. All right. And, and the disciples even say, shouldn't we go? Are we going to go? And uh, I love where there's little elements of humor hidden in the Bible because uh, Jesus says, Lazarus is asleep. I'm going to go there later and wake him up. And the disciples say, oh, well, that's good that he's resting. And Jesus says, he's dead. You know, it's like, guys, okay, I said he's asleep. He's dead. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going to go there to wake him. So what happens is Jesus stays where he's at, preaching, healing, teaching, doing everything that he's doing. And then he shows up after Lazarus is already dead. Upon his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So I don't know how long it took Jesus to get there. They sent word while he was sick. Obviously, he's already passed away. And he's been in the tomb for four days by the time Jesus arrived. He gets there. Everybody's around. They're mourning. Martha heard that Jesus was coming, and she went out to meet him. Mary stayed at home. There's two different responses. Mary said, I'm going to go out and greet my Lord. Martha said... I'm not going to go greet the Lord. We sent word to him to help. Did he help? No. Now, I, I'm taking liberties with this, so always don't go with me, go with the Bible. But I read into that that Martha says, you know what? It's like a friend of mine um, who just still cannot land at a place of belief in God. And he tells me, you know, I prayed one time. And I'm pretty sure it's when we were in college and his father was ill and ended up passing away. Um, he said, I prayed one time and nothing happened, so I can't believe in God. I feel like that's kind of maybe where Martha was, that she didn't go out, oh, Jesus is coming. Well, great. So what? I don't know. That's kind of what, what I'm reading in this. But here's where really hit me is in verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So many times we keep going in the story and we keep reading that. But did you hear her words? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. How do you think she said that to Jesus? Maybe she said, Lord, if only you had showed up. Lord, if you'd been here, if you knew what was going on, if you cared about me, if you hadn't left me here alone, if you had done something, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. Where were you? If only you had been here. It's a great faith. She knows he could have done something, but he didn't. So the story goes on, and Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And she says, yeah, I know. I know at the end of all things, and I know. That's fine. And, and you know, Jesus asked her about her belief. And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come to the world. We go later, Martha has now come out, and she says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, how, how did she say that? How, was, was she the same as Mary? I don't know, but the, the point is knowing that you did nothing. You didn't do anything. In our biggest time of need, where were you? Where were you? Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, and he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Why did Jesus cry? You know, we, we look at this verse so many times. Sometimes we, we laugh about it and, oh, well, I'm going to start memorizing Scripture. I'll start with John 11, that verse, Jesus wept, 35. I can memorize that one, Jesus wept. Or sometimes we think, well, you know, Jesus, he was fully man, he was fully God, so, you know, 
that must have been the man side of him that was that just moved and, and he wept. He wasn't crying for Lazarus. He, he knew before he got there what was going to happen. He told the disciples, I'm going there to wake him up. So he's not crying over, over Lazarus. And the Bible doesn't say Jesus, you know, kind of choked up a little bit. You know, Jesus said, oh, hold on, guys. It's just something in my contact. Hold on. It's okay. It says Jesus wept. And, you know, and I've always kind of looked at that and thought, well, you know, that's the human side of Jesus. But I want to suggest to you that was the divine side of Jesus, that God wept. Why did God cry? Why did he weep? He knew how the story was going to end. He knew what was going to happen. But it says right here in the scripture, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Psalm 34, 18 says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Isaiah 53, 3, prophecy about Jesus hundreds of years before he came to this earth, says that he was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. He knew suffering. Isaiah 61 says that he's sent to comfort those who mourn. When, when uh, Jesus gave the famous Sermon on the Mount, the second thing that is recorded that he said is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In other words, if you want to be blessed, you need to mourn. But we think, oh, if I mourn, I'm showing a lack of faith in God. I'm not trusting God. No. Mourn. Jesus was so moved in spirit and troubled that he wept. Wept doesn't mean he teared up a little bit. He wept. He mourned with them. We have a God who is a suffering God who mourns with us. And we could say, well, God, why didn't you stop it? Why did you let this happen to me? If only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And I don't know. I can't answer that one. I know uh, God put on my heart something I hadn't thought about in a while, but um, when we just had our older two kids, we were moving to Oldham County. And uh, Lucas at the time was uh, about three and a half, and... Um, our house in Shelbyville was empty. We'd moved everything out, and it just hit him for the first time. His whole world, all he ever knew was his room, this house. And uh, it was the, what do you mean we're not coming back? You know, a three-and-a-half-year-old trying to process this. And teachable moment, here we go. I'm going to say something great, and he's tearing up, and he's crying. And the only thing I could do was cry with him. As his father, could I have changed it? I could have. I could have said, okay, bring the furniture back in. This is hurtful. This is painful. We're not going to do it. I could have stopped it, changed it. But I, I knew in the long run there was something different and that he would be okay as his father, even though this hurt. But we do that. We get into this, well, why did you let it happen? Did God send this? Did he allow it? Could he have stopped it? I don't know. But I know in the beginning things were perfect. In our destination, things will be perfect. But right now, we're in the in-between. And when sin and death came into the world, things got messed up. But God does not leave us alone. The Bible, we, we tend to think it says, grieve not. Because we're Christians. We've got this great trust in God. So grieve not. No, what, what the Bible says is grieve not as those who have no hope. And what it really means is do grieve. You have to grieve, and, and God surrounds us. Practically, he surrounds us with the body of Christ, you know. But here's something where we need to do better, and, and we, we tend to think something happened, I'll make a casserole. And that's good. And uh, sometimes instead of, uh, you know, pouring out words, we need to pour out ingredients in a dish and make a casserole and support. But sometimes uh, we just need to be quiet. I, I think one of the uh, first uh, visitations I ever went to, it was just, oh, I've got to say something and comfort them. Shut up. Gosh, you're just going to make it worse, you know, and, and, and we don't have that. 
Uh, we don't, we don't, nothing we can say or do can help in these moments. And um, great blessing Friday night. I uh, got to go to a, a concert. Big Daddy Wee was in town. And uh, Jason Gray uh, was uh, one of the opening acts. And um, he came out and he starts talking about grief. And I thought, okay, Lord, I'm sitting there trying to make mental notes. What's he talking about? And um, he, he sang this song that I had never heard before. And um, it's just really fantastic for us to learn from. So I'm going to take a moment, since singing is what I do, and uh, share this song with You can see the smoke a mile away Trouble always draws a crowd They want to tell me that I'll be okay but That's not what I need right now Now while my house is burning down I know someday I know somehow I'll be home, but not right now, not right now. Tell me if the hope that you know is true. Never feels like a lie even from a friend When the words are salt in an open wound And they just can't seem to understand That you haven't even stopped the bleeding yet I know someday I know Happen for a reason. Maybe one day we'll talk about the dreams they had to die for new ones to come alive. But not right now. Wait with me for the smoke to. You don't even have to speak Just sit with me in the ashes here And together we can pray for peace To the one acquainted with our grief I know someday I know someday Not right now, not right now. Sometimes we just need to be there in the ashes and in the smoke 
and just be there. You know, I do know that God says in Romans 8, 28, that he works all things. And it doesn't feel good at the time, and it's very hard at the time. But all things work for the good of those who are called according to God's purposes that God loves. All things work together for the good. And here's a part that's hard, but a part that's healing. Whatever grief you've gone through, however hard it is, wherever you're still at in that process, is you're not the last one that's ever going to go through what you've been through. And when the next person goes through it, who better to walk alongside them than somebody who has been there? That God can take that and use that. Sometimes our worst hurt becomes our best ministry. Because you know you've been there. And, and, and you see this you know, play out in the world, people that have lost... Uh, loved one to a drunk driver, man, they, they champion that cause and they go out and do it. And, and how much better for the body of Christ to take our hurt and turn that around and minister to it? Because that's the hard thing is we're not the last one that's going to go through what we've been through. So let's walk beside the next people coming along to go through that and know that God is there with us in our worst moments where we think God has left us. Maybe he's right there holding us like I was with Lucas in that room. And that's a tiny little insignificant thing, a three and a half year old moving. But I think the story is the same, that God sometimes comes along to us, side of us, and he grieves. That when Jesus wept, he was so moved that he joined us in our mourning. But he gives us those days. Beyond it. You know, some days with my mom, we, we think of things and we laugh. And we've moved from morning to laughter, but other times it's last week. I was so exhausted at the end of last week from going through that song two times. And, and you know, I, um, and I ha have another memory of my daughter. We were listening to that song one time, and I told her, you know, that was, uh, was one of Mama's favorite songs. It, Chloe just sat there and weeped. But you know what? After a big cry, don't you feel better? We fight it. We fight it, especially us men. And it's terrible when we do that to our boys. Get up, son. Don't cry. Cry. You know, my, uh, when Lisa's mom passed away, um, her sister, before the funeral service started, was just deeply moved in mourning. And she had a lady come up to her that said, be strong, be strong. And I thought, really? Then when are you ever going to cry if this isn't it? Her mother has passed away. Let her cry. You know, we get this, be strong, be strong. Get over it. You know, let cry. Sometimes you got to have a big nasty cry and you get that out and it's painful. It's almost like... Uh, when you're sick, if there's anybody who hates to throw up, it's me. I'll be violently sick for days, and I know if I just go throw up, it's going to be better. I'm going to feel better, but I can't do it. I hate to do it. can't do it, but probably not the sermon notes you want to take on that one. But sometimes that's the, that's the healing that comes through that. It comes through that just to get it out and to work through it. And there's going to be good days, and there's going to be bad days, and the, the uh, but... I feel like the songs that we sang today, they're hard to sing. You know, you give and take away. Hard to sing. But we know at the end of things that he is God. That's the one thing that's, that's for sure that we know. And, and I think it's ingrained in us. You can take the biggest atheist and some big life event happens. And what are they going to say? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's just ingrained in us. Now, we, I could go on a tangent about how we misuse that everywhere in our culture, and it's ridiculous, but it's ingrained in us. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's all that we have, and that we know that he won't leave us or forsake us. And I hope there's some comfort in you to look back at that story of Lazarus. Because Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew I was there, but he was so moved that he wept. And that God is not immune to our suffering. And sometimes life 
sucks. It just does. But there's there's also beauty in it. And I don't know if it's 80, 20, <laughs> if she's got that right or not. Sometimes it feels like 95, 5. Other times it, you know, flips the other way. But um, Jesus said in this life we're going to have troubles. And we do. And we're not being a bad Christian if we're in a, a period of mourning. You know, yeah, I believe God is there. But I don't feel like smiling right now. That's okay. That is okay. But crying, I, I love what Rick Warren said. He said, crying is a sign of strength. Fighting your emotions is just tiring, but crying is a sign of strength because it means you care. If you don't care, you're not going to cry. You're not going to be moved to tears if you don't care. So I thought about that, that maybe uh, next tough man contest they have at the fair or something, maybe we need a, all right, men, let's cry. Let's do it. Let's weep. Let's do it. Show how tough you are. <laughs> but I'm just going to leave you with uh, one of my uh, favorite verses from, um, it, it's from Isaiah. And it's what Jesus read from the scrolls when he began his earthly ministry. And first thing that ever got him trouble, in trouble with the crowds, because he said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He says, listen, this is why Jesus came, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. I'm not hearing anything about so you can go around and act like you got everything together and just smile and, and act like nothing's wrong. You know, we get so shocked when there's a moral failure somewhere and, and somewhere we've built this, oh, well, we just got to be perfect. People, I hate it when, when people cuss around me, not because hearing the cussing, so what? I hate it because, oh, they found out I'm a minister. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm okay. You know what? If I didn't say that this morning already, I was thinking it when <laughs> such and such happened. Why do we think that as Christ followers, we're just supposed to get up and pretend that everything's just perfect? Jesus did say that he came. I came so you could smile every day and, and just... Pretend everything's right. And I think that's one reason people have such a problem with the church because we just go around and act like, oh, it's okay. Everything's okay because we love God. And He's for me and it's, it's great. And, and yeah, God is for you and there's a lot of great promises of God, but there's also a time to mourn and a time to weep and a time to be sad. And we need to just get over that. I think if the people could see real hurting and healing in the church, I think it would be attractive. Jesus said he came to proclaim good news to the poor, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for the captive, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty. Here's where it gets good. Here's where we have the trade. A crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, garment of praise instead of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So we need to be honest and open and forthright in front of God for his healing and for his love. And what's that say? It's going to be a display for the world to see of God's splendor. Instead of ashes, we have beauty. Instead of despair, we have a garment of praise, joy instead of mourning. We go through all that and we have that tension of all that. But I think God weeps with us. And then he carries us and he puts people around us to walk with us. And then at some point he turns that around where we can walk with others. And we're never truly healed, I don't think. Rick Warren called it, we're a wounded healer. That when we can provide healing to others, we can easily say, well, I can't. I'm still not over my grief. How can I help them? I don't know, but you can. You can. You can turn that around and walk beside somebody else because you've been there and you know. And God will give you beauty for ashes and better days ahead, but you'll never be the same. Never be the same. But you might still be something beautiful because God will work all things for his good. All things for his good. Let's pray.